Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my great joy to welcome you to this service of worship on the first Sunday of Advent at The Vine, an online campus of Wrightsville United Methodist Church. We are so grateful that you have chosen to worship with us today, and we believe that God is going to encounter you in this time. So now I invite you to take a big, deep breath, and let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Our congregational prayer for this season of Advent is one written by the wonderful writer and theologian Henry Nowen. Please join me now in this opening prayer. The words are found on your screen. Lord Jesus, master of both the light and the darkness, send your Holy Spirit upon our preparations for Christmas. We who have so much to do and seek quiet spaces to hear your voice each day, we who are anxious over many things look forward to your coming among us. We who are blessed in so many ways long for the complete joy of your kingdom. We whose hearts are heavy seek the joy of your presence. We are your people, walking in darkness, yet seeing the light. To you we say, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Isaiah 60, verses 2 through 3. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. We light this candle as a symbol of Christ, our hope. May the light sent from God shine in the darkness to show us the way of salvation. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Oh 
My name is Eun Siu Kang. I'm one of the associate pastors here. It is my great joy to lead us in prayer. Please join me as we pray together. Holy and loving God, as we gather here on this first Sunday of Advent, our hearts are filled with anticipation and hope. We come before you with grateful heart, thankful for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, whose birth we celebrate in this season of Advent. Lord, in this season of waiting and preparation, we ask that you prepare our hearts and minds to receive your word and your love. Help us to set aside the busyness and distractions of this world so that we can focus on you and your promises. Help us not to lose sight of the true purpose of Advent. May our heart be centered on you, Jesus, as we remember your promise that you are with us always. As we light the first Advent candle symbolizing hope, we are reminded of the hope that you bring into our lives. In a world filled with uncertainty and darkness, you are the source of our hope and our salvation. We place our trust in you, knowing that you are the light that shines in the darkness. So Lord, we pray for those who are struggling and hurting during this Advent season. We especially pray for these whom we now name with our voices or in our hearts. Lord, in your never-ending mercy, in your great goodness, hear our prayers. May your love and comfort surround them, and may they find hope in you. As we continue with our worship service today, may your presence be felt among us. May our worship be pleasing to you, and may it bring glory to your name. We humbly offer this prayer in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now take a moment to offer our heart and gift. As we respond to God's grace and God's generosity, I'd like to remind you that you can give to the ministry of Ricefield United Methodist Church through our website, smartphone app, and via mail. Let us continue to worship God. Hello friends, I'm Pastor Eun Seo. I'm so excited to share this time with you. Today, I have brought something special to get us started. Look at this balloon. When you look at a balloon like this, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Yeah, you got it, birthdays. Happy birthday. And guess what? Today is the first day of a special season, a season in which we are looking forward to someone's birthday. Can you guess whose birthday? Yes, it is the birthday of Jesus, which we celebrate as Christmas. And the time of excited waiting for Jesus' birthday is called Advent. So today is the first Sunday of Advent. Advent means the coming of someone or something very important.
important. It's like countdown to celebrating Jesus' birth and Christmas. So just as we see Christmas trees or Christmas signs or hear Christmas songs around us, we also have special symbols and signs for Advent too, such as we light Advent candle. So now we know that we are eagerly waiting for Jesus' birthday with excitement in our heart. But do you know why it is so important to celebrate Jesus' birthday? Yes, it is because Jesus is not just the ordinary person. Jesus is the Son of God, and Jesus is sent to earth to bring us hope, peace, joy, and love. It is the best gift that we could ever receive. So this is why Advent is a special time for us to remember this incredible gift from Jesus. So now I want us to prepare for Jesus' birthday, just as, well, when we prepare for a birthday party with decorations, cake, or gifts, or presents, we can prepare for Jesus' birthday by making our heart ready. We can do this by showing love others and by being kind and forgiving and also by spending time in prayer and reading Bible. When we love and help others, we are sharing Jesus' love with the world. And when you read stories from the Bible, we learn more about Jesus. It is like getting to know the birthday person better. So these are ways to prepare for Jesus' birthday. So Bill Rice Bill Kids, are you ready to prepare for Jesus' birthday with excitement? Great! Let us count down to Jesus' birthday with excitement and heart full of love. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us prepare our heart to celebrate Jesus' birthday. In Jesus' name we pray, Amen. Good morning, I'm Doug Lane, Senior Pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, and I'm glad that you joined us for the first Sunday of Advent. We're going to be doing um, some really interesting things, I believe, uh, throughout the next few weeks as we present the message that is um, that tells the story of Jesus coming um, through uh, some different voices and different lenses um, over the next few weeks. So I just want to give you a little bit of a lowdown as to what to expect. I'm going to be preaching today about Joseph. Um, the person who um, sometimes gets forgotten in the Christmas story. And then uh, next week, Pastor and Sue is going to talk to us about uh, Mary um, and her important role in the birth narrative, of course. And then the very next week, Pastor Julia is going to come and share with us a different uh, story um, from uh, Mary's life. And so we'll learn a little bit more about her. And then uh, as the calendar has uh, come to kind of a, an odd place this year, the fourth Sunday of Advent is actually Christmas Eve. So we're gonna be sending out a couple of videos the week before Christmas. Pastor and Sue will be um, giving us our annual longest night service for those who are struggling at Christmas time this year. Perhaps uh, you may be grieving the loss of a loved one. Um, and uh, maybe just not kind of in the mood for all the Christmas excitement this year. Um, she'll have a message to speak to you. And then Pastor Julia will do our traditional fourth Sunday of Advent um, service, which will also be on video. It will come out that week, so we look forward to that. And then uh, Christmas Eve will be here on December 24th, so just um, three weeks away. So we're excited about all that uh, God has in store and is, and is doing, and I hope that, um, that these messages will speak to you. But as I said um, a moment ago, I'm going to be talking to you about Joseph. So if you will, uh, turn with me in your Bible to 
The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he'd resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we thank you that you sent us a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Father, I pray that um, the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts would be acceptable in your sight this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you only had Matthew's gospel, what would you have? In the more popular version of Jesus' birth story comes from the gospel of Luke. That's much more familiar. He begins with Zechariah and Elizabeth and the birth of John the Baptist, who would come to prepare the way for the Messiah. Then on to the Virgin Mary and the miracle birth of a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. But if you only had Matthew's version of the story, what would you have? Well, there'd be no annunciation from the angel to Mary, no visit to Elizabeth or Mary's song, the Magnificat, no details on cousin John's miraculous birth, no enrollment to call the holy parents to Bethlehem in the first place, no overcrowded inn, no stable, no manger, no sheep, no cattle lowing when the baby awakes, no angels singing from the realms of glory or shepherds watching their flocks by night. Now, if you only had Matthew, what would you have? Well, you'd have Joseph. Across the ages, we venerate Mary and sing about shepherds who rush to see a Savior who is Christ the Lord. We are hushed by the wonder of angels singing sweetly over the plains and the mountains in reply echoing their joyous strains. We even tell tales of an innkeeper who isn't really in the story, a drummer boy who's purely fictional, and kindly beasts that are really only assumed. But we have none of that in Matthew. Matthew begins with what we in our day consider to be the somewhat boring details of Joseph's genealogy, tracking back across the centuries to show the connection of this baby with all the people who came before him, linking Joseph through, excuse me, linking Jesus through Joseph to the long journey of faith that begins with Abraham and Isaac and goes to David and Solomon through the exile and the Babylonian captivity, all of it building to the birth of this child. Matthew focuses on Joseph's dream and on Joseph's response. And in less than a sentence, he tells the entirety of the birth story itself. Then he fast forwards around two years later, according to the story, to the mysterious visit of the Magi from the east, followed by Herod's brutal response when he orders the slaughter of Bethlehem's babies. And of course, it is Joseph who once again comes out the hero. He has another dream and saves the child by taking his family to Egypt, where they live as refugees until King Herod dies. So if you only had Matthew and you only had Joseph, what would you have? Well, first of all, you would have a declaration of comfort, a promise that everything will be all right with just three little words. Don't be afraid. 
It's worth noting that this message is repeated over and over again in the other Gospels too. It's said to Zechariah and Elizabeth, to Mary, to the shepherds, and now to Joseph. Don't be afraid. It's this redundant but all-important promise which provides the reoccurring theme that runs throughout the whole story. When God calls, when God acts, when God moves, the first promise is the promise to cast out all our fears. Don't be afraid. Now I'll tell you, if an angel ever spoke to me, that'd have to be the first thing the angel would have to say to me too. For you might think, oh, how sweet, an angel's come to visit. I'd be thinking, oh my God, what do you want from me? Am I dying? Have I died? Am I in heaven now? Are you gonna ask me to do something really crazy hard? Could you not just send this to me in an email or a text? Even a burning bush might be better than this. I think we'd all be scared in such a situation. And God knows that. So even though it may be frightful to find yourself in the presence of an angel, and even though life may indeed have frightful elements in it, and there are plenty of things to fear, if God is present and active, his first invitation is always the invitation to get beyond our fears as the primary force in our lives and discover a calm center in the midst of the crisis. Messages from angels always begin with the saying, don't be afraid. No matter how bad the news, no matter how panic-stricken the news reporter may sound, do not allow fear to control and dominate your life. Yes, the world can be frightful. Joseph knows that better than anyone. But the world will not have the last word. God is always present, and by his grace, we need not fear. So if you only have Matthew, and if you only have Joseph, once again, you have a promise of comfort that comes to everybody in this story. Don't be afraid. Secondly, if you only have Matthew and you only have Joseph, well, you've got a name, Jesus, and a nickname or a title for Jesus, Emmanuel. Matthew borrows from the Old Testament prophet, once again, to make the connection with the long prophetic history of covenant faith, and he gives this child a name. He says, you shall call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Matthew takes the prophet Isaiah's words of comfort and assurance from a long time ago and offers them as the name of the one who comes among us, the one who will be Joseph's son. Actually, the great hymn writer Charles Wesley says it better than I can. He says, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. Pleased with us in flesh to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel. When you strip away all the frills and flourishes, all the angel wings and starlight, when you take away the shepherds on bended knee, the sheep in the hay and the cattle lowing, when you get right to the heart of it, this is what lies at the heart of Christmas, that God has not left us alone. He is ever present with us. God is no longer just out there somewhere, but has come to be one of us, to live with us in the flesh, to share in our lives, to experience our pain, going with us all the way to our death in order to make known God's unending, undeserved, unfathomable, unlimited love. <clears throat> I recently came across an article on the internet entitled, This Crazy Word World Could Use a Direct Word from God. The author offered a laundry list of everything that's currently troubling this world. Wars, of course, diseases, natural disasters, the ugliness of hate and racism, <clears throat> excuse me, the prevalence of violence, both here and abroad. And then she says, I've come to the conclusion that there's only one answer, that God is going to have to come down here and settle things once and for all. 
Sure, it'd be a little freaky if the world came to a halt and there was God in a burning bush or a chariot of fire, but I say it's time. Well, here's the thing. God has already done that. God has already come down here to settle things once and for all. God has already spoken. He's spoken in the form of a child born to Joseph and Mary. Spoken through the parables of an itinerant teacher and healer. Spoken in the way he treated others. Spoken ultimately from a cross. And spoke, no dare I say, shouted from an empty tomb. And if we're not going to listen to the word that's already been spoken, there's little chance we're going to listen to the next one either. You know, I happen to enjoy going to church leadership conferences, but oftentimes after listening to all the ideas and suggestions from the different speakers, I often say to myself, you know, I knew that already. And it leads me to the conclusion that I know more than I'm doing. The truth is we probably all do. God could send another direct word into this crazy world, but the fact is, we already know more than we're doing. We have heard. We have seen God's word already. It was made flesh in Jesus Christ. We already know that we should do unto others as we would have them do unto us. We already know that we should love our enemies and pray for those who despise us. We already know that the peacemakers are blessed and shall be called children of God, that the meek are blessed and will inherit the earth, that the merciful are blessed because they shall receive mercy. We already know we should forgive 70 times 7. We already know we should turn the other cheek. We already know that it's more blessed to give than to receive. We already know that love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and that love never ends. We've already seen and heard the word from God, and we've beheld his glory. Glory is in the only begotten Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. And frankly, we already know more than we're doing. We already know this one named Jesus, who came to save us from our sins, this one called Emmanuel, which means God with us. He's already here and now with us. So if you only have Matthew and you only have Joseph, if you've got a promise, and you've got a name, that name means God with us. Finally, you have a task. The angel said, Joseph, heads up. I got a job for you. I want you to take Mary as your wife. She will bear a son. You will call his name Jesus. So get up, get going. Time to move out of the comfort zone of the carpenter shop here and take up the task of carrying the Christ into the world, into a world of corrupt rulers while living among struggling refugees. You are entrusted with this task of preserving the gift, of nurturing the message, of caring for the good news. Maybe that's why we prefer Luke's version. Perhaps we prefer an advent focused on looking back across the ages to the warm memories of shepherds in the fields and silent nights, a baby in a barn and adoring angels. Perhaps we prefer a Hallmark Christmas or the Thomas Kincaid version, all misty and glowing candlelight. And of course, Luke's gospel has its place, but Matthew won't leave us there. See, if your lead character is Joseph, the Christmas story becomes one of awesome responsibility. A tale told in the face of warring worlds, of unjust rulers and suffering refugees, and the presence of families huddling and hiding and babies born in barns. If your lead character is Joseph, the Christmas angel comes with a calling, a task. There's work to be done, and it's up to you to do it. Several years ago, Marjorie Holmes wrote a fictionalized version of the Nativity, attempting to fill in the blanks, telling a love story of Joseph and Mary. It was called Two from Galilee. 
And after the word from the angel, she describes the conversation that may have taken place between Mary and Joseph, capturing his struggle with this call and this task. Mary says to him, Joseph, you don't believe. For all your reading of the scriptures, you don't believe. Joseph replies to her, Mary, I do believe. I do believe God will keep his promises. The Christ will come someday. But not now. Not to us in our time. Not in our town, to us or our neighbors, not to you and me. No, 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 no. This great event will happen far, far away to other people. That will make it credible and safe. People will not have it. They will not have evidence that God will keep his promises. Not if it's personal. Personal involvement in God's plan is too terrible. It costs too dearly. Well, fictional Joseph, you may be right. We all want to see God at work someplace else. We want to see God's kingdom come, God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven, but we prefer it was through someone other than us. We want to see the promises fulfilled, but certainly not here, not now, not in our time, not in our town, and certainly not through us because it's just too hard. It costs too dearly to become personally involved with God. But to encounter the angel of Advent is to become a part of a mission and a calling. The task given to Joseph becomes our task as well to carry the Christ into the world. So if you only had Matthew's gospel, all you'd have is Joseph. And if all you have is Joseph, well, you'd have a promise and a name and a task. And Matthew says very plainly, when Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel commanded him. May it be so. It may it be so in us as well this very day. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, you have borne onto this earth your Son, who is our Savior, who is our Lord. And Lord, you gave to Joseph, to Mary, the awesome responsibility of raising him and revealing him the people around him. Now that task is ours. Lord, give us the courage not to be afraid, to remember that you are with us, and to carry on the task of revealing Jesus to this world. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, if you only have Matthew, and if you only have Joseph, well, you actually have a lot because you have a promise not to be afraid. You have a name that means God is with us. And you have a task to reveal Christ to the world. Go forth with that task. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.